I'm confused. I... I think there is something strange going on. Like, what a what an odd time for us to be alive, you know, in all of human history. Like, wow, this is the most amazing technology ever, and it's moving really fast, and yet we're still, like, really disappointed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, like, it's not moving fast enough, mm-hmm. and, like, it's, right, like, maybe right on the verge of falling out. Mm-hmm. Overall, the models are, are um, they're not there. And I kind of feel like the industry, it's, it's, um, it's over, it's, it's making too big of a jump. Mm-hmm. And it's trying to pretend like this is amazing and it's not, it's slob. Yeah, and you know, are we in an AI bubble? Of course, right? You know, we were of course. in that bubble. You know, of course we are. I mean, you know, we're hyped, we're accelerating, we're putting enormous leverage. All right, so welcome or welcome back to this month in AI, your go-to monthly recap for staying up to date in the exponentially accelerating world of AI. This month felt like a tipping point between economic bubbles that refuse to burst, chips that rewrite physics, agents that can invest money on their own, and robots taking over jobs, it's getting hard to tell between what's hype and what's history in the making. So let's just get right into it. All right, so let's start off with what everyone's been talking about this month, the AI bubble. Bloomberg published this graphic that perfectly captures the circular nature of what's happening right now. At the center, you've got NVIDIA, basically the heartbeat of the AI economy, supplying the chips that power everything. Around it, you've got the other giants like OpenAI, Microsoft, XAI, and the cloud providers like Oracle and CoreWeave. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The arrows don't just go one way, they go both ways. For example, NVIDIA is investing in OpenAI, but OpenAI is also spending billions back on NVIDIA's chips. Same with Oracle, they're hosting OpenAI's cloud, but they're also buying tens of billions worth of NVIDIA hardware to power it. And it just keeps looping. AMD, Intel, CoreWeave, Microsoft, even XAI, all tied into this same feedback loop. Everyone is funding each other, buying from each other, and inflating each other's values in the process. It's literally as if they found an infinite money glitch. I mean, here is a perfect example of what's going on. OpenAI announced a massive partnership with AMD this month, planning to deploy 6 gigawatts worth of AMD GPUs. And AMD even gave OpenAI the option to buy up to 160 million AMD shares as part of the deal, which are now up a staggering amount. So OpenAI is now both a customer and a potential shareholder, meaning the company building AI models is literally investing in the company building the chips that build the AI models. And again, this is just one deal out of the many like it. And then on top of all this, you also had a Harvard economist declare this month that without data centers, GDP growth was only 0.1% in the first half of 2025. The build-out of AI infrastructure is literally the only thing keeping the economy alive. Of course, if AI wasn't a thing though, a lot of that money would likely be going into some other growth-based technology. But basically, all the money in the world right now is going into AI infrastructure, because that's where the most potential is. So the question isn't really, are we in a bubble anymore? It's more, when will this bubble pop? Here's former Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger's take on it, which I completely agree with. Yeah, and you know, are we in an AI bubble? Of course, right? You know, we were of course. in that bubble. You know, of course we are. I mean, you know, we're hyped, we're accelerating, we're putting enormous leverage uh, into the system. You know, that said, I don't see it ending for several years. So yeah, again, I don't think anyone's really arguing that we aren't in a bubble at this point. It's more a question of how big will it get, and when will it pop? OpenAI surpassed a $500 billion valuation this month, officially becoming the world's most valuable private company, and they're already looking toward a potential IPO in the coming years. And so while it definitely looks like a bubble, the numbers we're seeing here are also completely unprecedented, and so is the technology itself. It's insanely hard to predict what'll happen, but I'm riding this train till it crashes, or until it leads us into another universe. Because that's kind of what it feels like right now. This runaway AI train might be a bubble, sure, but it also doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. I mean, even OpenAI, the company building the models, is now getting into the chip business, partnering with Broadcom to design custom silicon built purely for their future AIs. They know today's GPUs can't handle what's coming, so they're building the hardware years ahead of time. 
Meanwhile, startups like Xtropic are pushing the limits of physics, creating thermodynamic chips that compute with energy flows instead of traditional bits. It sounds sci-fi and it's still early, but this is what the post-GPU world could actually look like. Even Google is teaming up with CFS Energy to make nuclear fusion practical, not for rockets or space exploration, but to power the massive data centers this AI boom is going to need. And it doesn't stop there. NVIDIA is talking about space-based data centers that could use the sun for power and the vacuum of space for cooling. Google's even already advancing quantum computing with a new breakthrough just this month. All of this points to the fact that we're still so early. So yeah, it's clear we're building the foundation for a whole new era of computing, a whole new paradigm shift. But here's the thing, for all the money, hardware, and breakthroughs we're pouring in, AI still kinda sucks. According to OpenAI co-founder and former Tesla AI lead, Andre Karpathy, AI models are still nowhere near acting like real employees. He says we're actually still a decade away from that, from AI being what the top labs envision it as. Here's why. Well, um, actually make it work. So in my mm. mind, I mean, when you're talking about an agent, I guess, or what the labs have in mind and what maybe I have in mind as well, is it's, uh, you should think of it almost like an employee or like an intern that you would yeah. hire to work with you. Uh, so for example, you work with some employees here. Yeah. Um, when would you prefer to have an agent like Claude or Codex uh, do that work? Like yeah. currently, of course, they can't. Uh, what would it take for them to be able to do that? Uh, wh right. Why don't you do it today? Yeah. And the reason you don't do it today is because they just don't work. So right. uh, like they don't have enough intelligence, they're not multimodal enough, they can't do computer use and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they don't do a lot of the things that you've alluded to earlier. You know, they don't have continual learning. You can't just tell them something and they'll remember it. Yeah. And they're just cognitively lacking and it's just not working. And I just think that it will take about a decade to work through all of those issues. Interesting. So yeah. He even goes on to call current AI slop later in the interview. And that kind of brings us back to the whole bubble talk, because we're seeing record-breaking valuations and trillion-dollar infrastructure build-outs, yet the core tech still isn't there, at least not yet. That said, if there's any technology that can close that gap faster than anyone expects, it's AI. We're already seeing small breakthroughs that chip away at those missing pieces, like DeepSeek's OCR paper, which compresses data into images, so models can pack roughly 10 times more context. I covered this paper in full on the channel already, but it's a major step toward real, long-term memory, the thing agents actually need to function like coworkers instead of just chatbots. And beyond research papers, we're actually starting to see agents getting tested in the real world. There's this new benchmark called Alpha Arena, where researchers gave six AI models actual money to manage, investing in crypto and tracking the results live. It's the first time we're seeing agents operate in an environment with real stakes, not just simulated ones. It's messy, some models are up a lot, others are down a lot. Keep in mind they started with $10,000 each, but we won't get a good picture until many more months have passed. Because, I mean, one week trading in crypto doesn't really mean anything. But these kinds of experiments are how agents evolve from lab demos into actually useful tools. The first real steps toward that AI coworker vision. And now, speaking of useful tools, we also saw OpenAI drop their long-awaited and highly anticipated AI browser this month, called ChatGPT Atlas. It's basically ChatGPT directly inside your browser. It can navigate web pages, summarize and act on information live, and basically take control of your web browser at any moment. It's one of the first examples of an AI agent that actually works, and that is actually somewhat useful. But again, it's really just the beginning of where we're headed. Right now, agents like Atlas are taking over the browsing experience for you. But once they have continual learning, long-term memory, full multimodality, all the things Carpathy mentioned, they won't just be browsing for you. They'll be working for you or for your boss. Which brings us to the next part of this month's recap. I'm sure most of you have seen the viral clips of OpenAI's new Sora 2 video generator flooding social media, but what you might have missed is the backlash it sparked in Hollywood. Actors are starting to realize it's only a matter of time before they're replaced. It's obvious when you look at how fast AI video models are improving, but it's perhaps less obvious when you think about AI agents, since they're not that good yet. But with the amount of infrastructure being built out, and the pace of research right now, both in software and in hardware, it's really only a matter of time as well. 
For example, this month, Amazon announced plans to replace up to 600,000 jobs with robotics and AI by 2033, with 30,000 corporate layoffs already underway. The wild part is, they're not even being quiet about the AI part. They straight up say these job cuts are due to AI. Amazon is also rolling out new delivery glasses for drivers, designed to quote, enhance the delivery experience. It makes it easier for them to identify hazards, navigate seamlessly to customers' doorsteps, and overall just improves the efficiency of their deliveries. But what they're not saying is that all of this footage and data will likely be going straight to the robots for training. Amazon is already working with several humanoid robot providers, and they've even been developing their own humanoid robot software. This month, they showed off a demo of a robot performing a completely autonomous backflip off a wall, which was honestly insane. And then outside of Amazon, we've got 1X Robotics with their new humanoid robot called Neo. Unlike the industrial bots being tested inside warehouses, Neo is being designed for use inside the home. It's built to assist with everyday tasks, cooking, cleaning, helping out. Basically, a personal robot that can live and work safely alongside people. And the crazy thing is, you can already buy it. For only $20,000 or 500 bucks a month, you can place an order from one of these Neo Home Robots, which they plan to start shipping in 2026. Meanwhile, Figure Robotics continues to show impressive progress with their latest model, Figure 03 also built to assist with everyday tasks, washing dishes, folding laundry, cleaning, all powered by AI models. So it's really only a matter of time before these humanoid robots, these embodied AI agents, are everywhere, roaming the streets, doing our jobs, and even doing our own personal chores. It's honestly wild. Finally, despite all the hype, fear, bubble talk, and robots, there's a powerful reminder of what this is all really about. Google DeepMind and Yale University released a mind-blowing biology model this month, built on Gemma, that discovered a completely new cancer therapy pathway. I covered this one in full on the channel, but essentially, a 27 billion parameter model trained on single-cell data predicted a drug combination that hadn't been seen before, and researchers actually validated it in a lab. The treatment helps turn cold tumors hot, making them visible to immunotherapy, meaning the body can finally fight back. It's still in early stages, but it's a huge step toward using AI not just to automate work, but to actually save slash improve lives, which is what it's all about. So to wrap things up, this month we saw the bubble grow bigger, the chips and data centers powering a new computing age, agents slowly becoming useful, robots stepping into the real world, and breakthroughs that might literally save lives. It's hard to predict where all this goes next, and how long it lasts, but one thing's for sure. We're living through the most transformative era of technology in human history. If you found this recap useful, drop a like, subscribe, and comment which story hit you the hardest. And as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.